my radar, tropical weather expert, Dr. David Riglicki here. And on today's episode, we're gonna be talking about hurricane landfall impacts. But before we begin, if you are watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button, be sure to hit that bell and give us a thumbs up. It really does help the channel out. Now, when it comes to hurricane landfall impacts, there are four of them that we have to be worried about. They are storm surge, rainfall, wind, and tornadoes. And I suppose you could group tornadoes and wind together, but for the purposes of this video, we're gonna keep them separate. But before we begin, let's take a look at where hurricane landfalls happen, at least on the East Coast. So stretching back to 1950 to 2021, you can see that hurricane landfalls can happen anywhere from the U.S.-Mexico border to the U.S.-Canadian border. So what that means is that if you live on the coast or around the coast, this is something you have to be concerned about. It may not be today, may not be tomorrow, may not be next year, but at some point you're going to have to deal with these things that we're talking about today. Now, when it comes to hurricane landfall damage, far and away, infrastructure damages are related to storm surge. But the question is, what is storm surge? Storm surge is simply the height of the water caused by the hurricane. It's that difference over what it would have been had the hurricane not been there for a regular high and low tide. But what causes all of this water to pile up from a hurricane? Well. To sort of answer this question, we're gonna take a look at model output from the SLOSH model. And SLOSH model is what is used by the National Hurricane Center to model storm surge effects as a hurricane is making landfall. And in this particular simulation, this is going to be from Hurricane Katrina, which I think is a storm we all remember. So as we watch this animation as Katrina comes in from the south, you're eventually gonna see storm surge on the Mississippi coastline that peaks somewhere between 20 and 25 feet. But if we freeze, right before landfall, you'll see that this is not equally distributed. It's favored on one side of the storm. As a matter of fact, the front right quadrant. So the reason for this is that it's due to hurricane motion and it's due to the hurricane motion undergoing what is called constructive interference with the swirling winds with the primary circulation of the hurricane. So on the right side of the hurricane, storm motion and the hurricane winds add on to each other where on the left side, they subtract from each other. And simply what's going on is that the hurricane winds are pushing up the ocean, and that's what causes storm surge. What causes the storm surge, how the hurricane can modify this, you know, it has to do with hurricane intensity and hurricane structure, yeah, of course, but it also has to do with hurricane speed and hurricane direction. Katrina was actually making, a, essentially making a perpendicular beeline for the Mississippi coast, and that's part of the reason why the storm surge was so high. There is another effect. It's uh, due to hurricane pressure. Due to the pressure falls in the eye, the sea level actually starts to rise due to this pressure fall, but this is a much smaller effect due to, simply due to uh, the hurricane pushing the water up and then pushing the ocean on shore. Now, the second effect we have to talk about here is rainfall. Now, when it comes to rainfall, this is a real point of emphasis from the National Hurricane Center. Rainfall is usually what's responsible for most fatalities. So storm surge, infrastructure damage, rainfall, fatalities. But when it comes to rainfall, sure, intensity and size do matter. But what seems to matter more here is actually speed. And it's the reverse of storm surge. So the slower a storm is moving, the more rainfall is going to deposit over a given area. And the hallmark for this, the greatest example is Hurricane Harvey from 2017, which dumped around five feet of rain in southeastern Texas. And if we take a look at the track and the rainfall map from Hurricane Harvey, we can see why this was, is that Hurricane Harvey basically stalled out over one area, dumped a bunch of rain, went back over the Gulf of Mexico and made landfall again. So these areas were just exposed to days of a deluge from Hurricane Harvey. As another example, we're gonna take a look at Hurricane Florence from 2018. Now Florence is interesting because Florence, much like Katrina, was making a beeline for the Carolina coast. But right before landfall, it hooked a sharp lift, went parallel to the coast and made landfall uh, closer to Wilmington. So what this, this had two effects. First, the storm surge went way down. So it had, it decreased to about four feet. And the second was that since Florence was over water, it kept pulling rain bands in and dumping this water over Carolinas. And, and somewhere as they got two to four feet, Wilmington actually turned into an island for three days, couldn't get in and out, all the roads were flooded. So that's part of what's going on here. And another thing I wanna make a mention of, independent of this, is that, and this is a real point of uh, messaging from the Hurricane Center, point of focus, 
is that just because a storm isn't named or a storm is in a category four at landfall doesn't mean you're not gonna get rainfall effects. As an example, PTC-01, which just crossed the Florida Peninsula here in 2022, dumped about seven to eight inches of rain over Miami, and that storm wasn't even named. The next one is wind, and I'm not gonna spend as much time on wind. I think this is mostly self-evident. As a matter of fact, when we talk about hurricane intensity, we usually use the Saffir-Simpson scale, and this is, isn't quite meteorologically derived. There's a civil engineering component, and each of the different categories basically indicate how much damage or what structures are, are most susceptible to uh, wind speeds of, uh, these, of these magnitudes. And this can stretch anywhere from, you know, just having trees bend over to limbs breaking off, to roofs being ripped off, to, you know, pieces of wood being lodged in trees like in Hurricane Andrew. So that really has to do with uh, land. Well, it's about what you expect. Now, the last one is tornadoes. And yes, hurricanes can spawn tornadoes, but just like with rainfall and storm surge, there's another component besides size and intensity that matters, and it's actually vertical wind shear. And specifically what vertical wind shear does is it causes the TC to tilt. And when it tilts, it changes the thermodynamic structure. Now, not to turn this into a tornado genesis video, uh, but tornadoes require very specific low-level environmental wind profiles and thermodynamic profiles to get themselves to get going. And hurricanes, sheared hurricanes at least, do provide these conditions. Now, it's not all of them. And the number of tornadoes can range from zero to the max that ever occurred was around 200. But it is something you have to be aware of. And once again, we'll go back to Florence. And there were about a dozen tornadoes associated with Hurricane Florence's landfall in the Carolinas. So with that, I think we can, uh, we can cap off this video on hurricane landfall impacts. And there are a lot of them. And uh, before I close out, I just want to remind you that hurricanes making landfall are really can be really deadly and really impactful and really destructive. So if a local emergency management office is telling you to get out, please do everything in your power to get out. So now, more than ever, this is Dr. David Erglicki saying thank you very much and reminding you, especially when it comes to hurricane landfall, be smart, be safe, be well. Until next time. Follow My Radar on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download My Radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, Xbox, and Windows.